You have a general goal. Do you want to be a cruise ship comic? Do you want to travel? Uh, do you want to be on television? Do you want to do movies? Do you want to be a comedy actor or actress? Si agara, camina, está esa mulata. Camina, ay mamita, camina, anda. Camina, sale un poquito para acá. Welcome to Common Sense Mamita. I am Lydia Nicole. If you want to know anything about acting tips, showbiz insight, or life lessons, you have come to the right place. If you have not subscribed yet, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can get information in real time. Today, we have an extraordinary comedian slash author slash writer amazing person and I am just so excited to introduce him to you because he is a phenomenon please help me welcome Daryl Littleton senior yeah hey Daryl how, <laughs> how are, are you, you good to see you Long good time. where did you grow up at I grew up in Los Angeles oh you did yeah grew up in LA wow were you born in LA I was or? born in LA I was born at a uh, general hospital I think they ripped that thing down wow uh, yeah it was back a long time ago and uh born in LA lived in what they did not call South Central back then then we moved to Watts Compton then South Central then Inglewood, and then I graduated and went off and lived my life. Where'd you go to high school? Inglewood High. And how did you get into uh, stand-up comedy? I was a bachelor for about 10 years, so I was happy for about 10 years. And then I got married. My wife had to move her mother and her, her, her mother and her dad were together, and the dad was a deadbeat. So they lost their place, and it's like, well, my parents need a place to stay, and can my mother come stay with us? And it's like, I thought it was going to be a short period of time. Ended up being 13 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, for the weekend. Can she stay for the weekend? Turned out to be 13 years but her dad who was the deadbeat I couldn't let him come and I didn't know this before I got married because I just had girlfriends what I found out is wives can become if they bring their mother around they go back to being daughters if they bring their kids around they go back to being mothers mm -hmm. so the wife role is like you know I signed up for this but this other stuff was actually more important so when her mother moved in she stopped being the the wife and she started being the daughter again and so I had to get out of the house at night because I couldn't have her mother running my house so I had done acting but the problem with acting is you have to be in a player you have to be in a production so with comedy you could say well I gotta go out and do a show tonight or I gotta go out and work out or I gotta do an open mic and so that's how I actually got into comedy how mm -hmm. did you start acting I started acting in college I was a musician in uh, middle school and high school and then I went to a music camp and found out how not as good as I thought I was I was we were playing in funk bands and I was a good funk trumpet player and then what happened was disco came in and you didn't need any of, all you needed was a keyboard, press the button, you know, and so you didn't need to take out a whole band anymore. So once that came in, it's like, well, I still want to do something. When I got into acting, it was in the 80s and I did a lot of theater, but there wasn't a lot of on camera opportunity because they were making movies like Ferris Bueller and Pretty in Pink mm -hmm. and uh, not very black friendly flicks. <laughs> you know, if you weren't in an Eddie Murphy movie, you probably weren't really working as a black actor. And much. Have an agent at that time? I had an agent. I, I'm trying to. I don't want to throw out her name because she said, "Are black people calling themselves African American now?" And I said, "Yeah." She said, "Oh my God, I've had part for African Americans, and I've been submitting Africans." That's the kind of agent I had. But you know, this was kind of like in the uh, what was going on in the eighties. Not <laughs> much has and changed. Not a whole lot has changed. What made you think you could do stand up? Uh, because I was funny. I'd just been funny in school. You know, a cut up. No, I, I don't think I was any funnier than anybody else. But but I was consistent and I liked doing comedy. Even um, when I was a musician, I wrote some songs and they were all along the uh, the funnier novelty, not um, the Weird Al Yankovic, but more like, who was that guy that did Bertha Butt Boogie? That was Jimmy Castor. Right, right, along mm -hmm. that line. Mm -hmm. So a guy, his name was Greg Pittman. I was working at a mortgage company and he said that you should go and try to, you know, since I know you write stuff and you jot down stuff, Tom Joyner's looking for writers. So I went down, I did the Tom Joyner short. Brad uh, Sanders was the head writer. I brought in three bits and he bought one that day. And it was like $50 and it changed my world. It's like, really? I just took some time and wrote some stuff and $50 and Uncle Sam didn't know anything about it. This was 30 years ago, so don't worry. You're not getting your money at this point. But nobody knew anything. It was just, here's some cash and it's like, okay, so I, I can get next to this. And musically, you have to practice every day. If you're going to be a horn player, you got to practice every day. 
Yeah, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. And like I said, that wave, it kind of went. And then the acting wave, like I said, it was a matter of, well, you got to be in theater and you got to, you know, do the plays. Because the sidekick role wasn't really happening in the 80s in film. You had the leading man mm -hmm. guys mm -hmm. and you had the comic relief, but I really wasn't a comic at that point. So I would have been the sidekick and there just weren't enough leading characters to even have sidekicks. Mm -hmm. That didn't come in until the 90s when hip hop came in and then you saw a lot more black sidekicks. Well, by then I was in comedy. So what was the first room you did stand up in? I did Marla's Memory Lane, which was over on uh, King Boulevard. I think it's Obama Boulevard, right? They changed, okay. Yeah, they changed yes. the name of it. So Obama Boulevard, and no, um, it was Rodeo. That's that what the one they changed. changed right, Obama. right. So King is still King. Good. Yes. I, I, I was hoping they wouldn't replace one black guy with you know, yeah, one black street in this neighborhood. I did Marla's Memory Lane, and the uh, the host, his name was Andrew Mohammed. I don't know if you were familiar with him. I don't remember him. I mean, I had gone to Marla's, but I, I him he, I don't remember. He was a nice guy, very nice, but he sounded just like Lou Rawls. Mm. And I had no opening line, so I remember going up and I said, "Give it up to Lou Rawls." <laughs> and the place laughed, and it was my first laugh on stage as a comedian. And it's like, okay, well, I, I want to do this. And then the rest of my act worked because uh, I had established, okay, well, I'm funny enough, so you can laugh at the next five minutes I do, and they laughed at that. And then I just started doing the uh, circuit. I went to a uh, comedy act theater, and Robin Harris was hosting. It was my third time on stage. I had called and said, I'm a comedian. I need, uh, I need some stage time. Put me up. Michael Williams said, okay, we're going to put you up this Thursday night, come on through the club. Just introduce yourself, you know, the host and all that. Hey, Robin Harris, I'm D. Miller John, I'm a comedian. <laughs> and so he does his thing, and Robin was one of the most hilarious comedians I've ever seen in life, period, to this moment. And then he brings up Martin Lawrence. So Martin goes up and he does his thing. I've only been on stage twice before this. The place is filled. I'm talking about Pat Robert was probably there. Robert Townsend was probably there. Because I know Mike Tyson was there. Denzel Washington was there. Wesley Stites was there. Uh, Lakers were there. Uh, there was just the room was full of celebrities. I mean, it was packed. People standing in the back. And I died the death of a million dogs. Yeah, you're fine in Marlis Memory Lane. And you were fine. I think I went somewhere else. Uh, paid for it, Ronaldo Ray used to mm -hmm. do. Um, because they were more kind of like bars. Right, right. This was more like a comedy club environment. These Chinese. people were Restaurant up. comic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I died. It was, it was terrible. And I remember I wanted to leave. And the wife I was married to at the time, I've had more than one. The wife I was married to at the time said, oh, you can't go anywhere. Because if you leave now, you'll never get back up. Mm. And, you know, you'd be that was very smart of her. It was, it was, to her credit. She kept me on. Because it wasn't like I was never going to do comedy again. I just wanted to get out of that doggone room. Right, I just right. wanted to get away because I knew it. And then Robin, of course, came on and roasted me for about five I had to listen to that, but um, I didn't die, <laughs> you know, yes. and I said, wow, well, this is that as bad as it gets? Oh, it gets worse than that. I got booted at the Apollo Theater by the Apo the entire Apollo. This is when I was, uh, I had broken out D. Miller Todd. I had on the, the, beret. Uh, the beret, and I had on a dashiki, and I had on shades, and I said, I'm going to leg them, and the entire place started booing. And this happened, and now this is funny, because it happened in October of 1992. November of 1992, Malcolm X came out. I went back February of 1993 and played the Apollo. Assalamu alaikum. Yay! Everybody's on their feet here. Because they didn't understand and what, it was before. what I was talking about before. And same place, not the same audience, obviously, right. but same place, same act, same guy. But a little bit of knowledge changed everything. Speaking of knowledge, I, I'll tell this one quick story. I went overseas and performed with Doug Stanhope, and that was really cool. Doug is actually a cool guy. And um, came back and tried to get into the comedy store. They were doing Monday night auditions. I had to audition eight weeks in a row because they just Sounds didn't have enough audience. Because right. uh, she kept saying, well, I really like you. This is Mitzi Short. I really like you, but I need more people to know if you're really that funny as I think you are. Seven weeks, seven weeks, seven weeks. And so I finally go to the manager. I said, look, man, I mean, how often do you guys have to? He's like, well, this is a lot, but, you know, we don't have a big audience. Let me ask you this. When you do hire a comedian to be a regular, how much time do they get to do? Well, about 20, maybe 30 minutes max. I said, I've come here for seven weeks and given you two, 10 new minutes every week. You got 70 minutes. So I'm not even going to do 70 minutes. So... You know, I'm not trying to be a pain or nothing, but I can't just keep coming here, man. I mean, what's the point? And he said, okay, I'll talk to her. And he came back and told me, she's going to audition you tonight, and she'll either accept you or say no. Well, it was funny. She said, okay, I'm going to sit on down in the booth. You got to sit down in the booth with her like it was a big deal. Right. 
And she said, I'm going to make you a regular. And I said, okay, you know, cool, thank you, I appreciate it. And she said, I like Whoopsie Wooly. I said, what? <laughs> and she said, I like Whoopsie Wooly. And I said, well, okay, well, who's that? It's like, that's what we're going to call you. <laughs> it's like, what? well, you know, I was kind of shocked. It's like, oh, well, I walk in with one name, I walk out with another. And a name I did not like. Um... <laughs> I, I said, well, I got a stage name. I, I go by D. Militant. And she's saying, yeah, but I like Whoopsie Wooly. And, and, and she did this flourish. Yeah, Whoopsie Wooly, like that character you play, carefree, happy-go-lucky. And I'm thinking, Whoopsie Wooly sounds like a black guy with a pancake flipper and a, <laughs> got a rag in his back pocket. He wants you to rub his woolly head. And it, it, it just struck his coon to me. And I was like, well, I don't know about this Whoopsie Wooly. You know, and I know a lot of comics would have said, man, you was getting in the comedy store in 1991? Are you kidding? You know how many brothers was in there? You could count them on your hand. Honestly. Oh, no, I was there. Okay. Yeah, you, yeah, you remember that era. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but I'll be a coon, though. <laughs> you know, it's like, what, I got to go to Hollywood, and then I'll coon, and then I'll come back to the neighborhood and act like I'm a... No, I, I couldn't do it. So the night, uh, she said, well, come by Sunday. I said, well, can we use my regular name, girl? She said, ah, okay, well, we'll figure it out. Said, <laughs> you know, in other words, you're going to be whoopsie woolly. Uh, she said, come by Sunday night. Your name will be on uh, the sheet for the sign-up, I mean, for the order. And I get there, and I'm looking at the sheet, and it's like, I don't see D. Militant. It's like, well, okay, maybe she put Daryl Littleton. Don't see no Daryl Littleton. It's like, oh, God. Whoopsie Wooly. Whoopsie Wooly is right there at 915. So back then they didn't have, you know, DJs or anything. Right. They had the piano player. Right. You know, you introduce you and play piano and you go on up to stage. I go to the piano player because I'm looking like this comic up there and I'm next. And I know I'm not going up to Whoopsie Wooly. <laughs> It's like anything else. If you do something once, once you will be stuck. Yeah, yeah and you, nobody. You cannot yeah. say, "Well, I've never done that." Yeah, you have. You were whoopsie woolly <laughs> that Sunday, so you're gonna be whoopsie woolly from now on. I, I went to the piano player and I said, "Hey, man, who's next?" <laughs> and he said, "Whoopsie woolly." I said, "Well, he's not here." And he said, well, he hasn't shown up yet. I said, he's never going to show up. He's never, ever going to be here. He's like, well, what's wrong? Is he okay? It's like, there is no Whoopsie Wooly, man. I mean, just, you seem like a cool guy. There is no Whoopsie Wooly. Uh, Mitzi wants me to be Whoopsie Wooly, but I can't be Whoopsie Wooly. He was a white guy, but he even understood. He said, I get it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, just think about the name, dude. So he said, okay, I get it. And he said, I said, just bring me up to Daryl Littleton. And I'll talk to Mitzi later. And then after that, she said, okay, you can be D. Militon. I checked with a couple of comics. And, you know, so they put my they put my picture on the wall, but they never did put my name on the wall. Never did. I didn't get and I was a regular like until the uh, L.A. riots came out, and then they gave me less and less. They were giving me like five spots a week. I was doing okay. People invited for people for showcases, got some stuff out of it. And then what happened was the L.A. riots came, and they cut me down to like one spot a week, and then nothing. And so I asked, and I said, well, Mitzi's going to let you go. She says, your comedy is too angry. <laughs> and I remember I laughed just like that. I said, wait a minute. You've got Andrew Dice Clay, Sam Kinison, and Paul Mooney. My comedy is angry? I think my comedy is just slightly perturbed. But okay, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Wow. So that's my well, Mitzi Shore story. It didn't, it didn't stop your flow. No, so. not, not at all. When did you figure out that you could also write comedy for other people as well as yourself? Self. Somebody wanted to use my material. I was approached by uh, Teddy Carpenter, comic from uh, D.C., and he said, I'm getting ready to do a pilot. I want to see if you would write some stuff for me. Prior to that, I had written for D.L. Okay, and uh, D.L. Ugly. D.L. Ugly mm -hmm. actually is the first one to approach me, now that I think about it. Teddy was the first one to hire me in a TV room writing position. Paul Mooney was the head writer. And, you know, this was my first writing room thing, but uh, D.L. had a show on KCAL. Um, and I can't remember the name of it. KCAL is a uh, Channel 9 out in Los Angeles. It was a short-lived show because his competition that very season was Arsenio Hall, mm. the first season of Arsenio. So they had the same time slot. Nobody was watching Dio. And he had said, well, I'm going to have you write for me. And this was before he did the BET this comic This was before you. BET. Okay. And then he, he had said, look, the writer that I have right now is not going to be with me, you know, past this initial stage, so I'm going to need a writer. Would you write for me for this KCAL show? Yes, I will. And we had met and all that. And then Arsenio... 
cut that loose, cut him off of that. But then he got BET. He had a guy named Vince D writing for him. Right. And Vince D, you know, him and Vince were friends. They were buddies. But what happened was I broke my leg in uh, 1993. And when I was going through the rehab on it, and I lost a lot of stuff with a broken leg, movies and everything mm-hmm. else. But um, during the rehab of it, I went to the barber shop, got my hair cut, left, and I wasn't doing anything else. So I said, well, let me go back to the barber shop. Went back to the barber shop. Dio was there. He said, my wife can't come pick me and the kids up. Could you drive us home? Drove him home and let him know that I was interested in doing writing because I'd broken my leg. I'd lost a lot of opportunities. So the in front of the camera stuff, but I needed something going like mm-hmm. right now before I could reestablish that. And he said, well, just write for me. And I said, what about Vince? He said, well, Vince and me are friends. And Vince will do stuff like I'm getting ready to go on stage. And you say, talk about fat women. And it's like, that's the, I'm looking for notes. And it, so he's, you know, and I said, no, I'll write for it. So I wrote for him. And then when he left uh, BET, Cedric became the host. And I wrote for him. I wrote for some more. I wrote for Don D.C. Curry. I wrote for Montana Taylor. And then I went overseas and toured around and entertained troops, which was fun. Who were your mentors when you started comedy? And who were your idols in, in comedy? First people I liked in comedy was uh, Groucho Marx, then Lenny Bruce. I liked Freddie Prinz. I grew up on Dick Gregory. I used to sneak and listen to Richard Pryor and Red Fox. I became a big LaWanda Page fan once I heard her uncut stuff. Not, you know, the Sanford and Son, the real LaWanda Page. Those were the people I really liked coming up. Uh, I like Jack Benny, too, because I, I thought Jack Benny's timing was incredible. The people who mentored me when I first got in, Robin Harris took the time, spent time with me. Uh, Ronaldo Ray spent a lot of time with me. Rodney Winfield, who people do not talk about. Very Rodney was funny. in incredibly funny. Mm-hmm. We used to fly from L.A., uh, no, from actually from Burbank to um, Oakland, back and forth, and do shows every Monday. It was a club called Sweet Jimmy. And the thing about uh, Rodney was, Rodney was so great, and I was just really like, oh, come on, green, compared to Rodney. Even if he was alive now, I'd still be green next to him. But he said, I'll host, you headline. And then we go, next week, I'll headline, you host. So that way I was able that to learn more skills. Mm-hmm. Yeah from a guy who was a master. Uh, Simply Marvelous was a mentor. Uh, Brad Sanders was a writing mentor. Uh, Michael Williams at the uh, Comedy Act Theater uh, helped me out, gave me a lot of pointers. Franklin Ajay. Milton Burrow gave me pointers. That was cool. How uh, did that happen? Howard Moore. Very cool Milton Burrow story. I had met Milton Burrow um, at the comedy store. He came and did a set. And this was in like the 90s, early 90s. You don't get to see, you, you don't think you're going to see Milton Berle or, or Jack Benny or any of those guys popping or George Burns. So Milton Berle did a set. And I you know, shook his hand later and said hi and, you know, good to see you and all that. Then I went on the road and I was gone for like three weeks. When I came back, this was uh, LAX before 9-11. Mm-hmm. So cars could just drive up to the front and people could hang out and all that. So Milton Berle pulls up in a limo. As people get out, they open the door and Milton Berle comes out. And I got my bags with me, stickers and all that on them. And I walked over and they said, hey, Mr. Burrow, I saw you at the comedy store about a month ago and I shook your hand and all that. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 I, I performed there. And he said, so, and he saw the bags. He said, you're a comedian. I said, yeah, I'm a comedian. He said, so where are you coming from? He said, you were just on the road? And I said, yeah, I just did over here and over here. And he said, really, how would a crowd? So we're talking comedy. His guy comes over to him and, and he's giving me pointers. He said, look, when you get certain crowds like this, blah, 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 when you get certain crowds like that, he said, well, how would a crowd now do? I know that's how it was when I was going around. He said, I'm like, man, not much change. I mean, what you just said. And he said, now, if you ever have a problem? So he was giving me a little advice as quick as he could. This guy comes over and says, Milton, we got to catch a plane. He said, whoa, 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 I got time. Look, I'm talking to a fellow comedian. That was really cool. Mm. That was, uh, it was like when Robin Harris told me, you're good enough now to go out and make money. So there were certain stamps I was getting from certain people. Witherspoon helped me a lot. Witherspoon told me about TV. John Witherspoon. John Witherspoon mm-hmm. told me about TV. I can't leave about Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory helped me out a lot. Dick Gregory gave me a lot of advice. So there were a lot of the senior comics. Dick Gregory was funny, though, because Dick Gregory has cursed me out in his <laughs> lifetime, three times <laughs> in my lifetime. And then he'll turn right around and call you a genius on another occasion. It won't be like he'll curse you out and say, but you know, I think you're a genius. It'll be a whole other occasion. He'll curse you out and it'll, it'll be, that's it. He left you alone. And then you'll talk to him another time and you'll be talking like the curse that never happened. And then he'll basically, at the end of it, he'll ask you, he asked me something about numerology. When I was born, he said, well, according to that, you're a genius. And I've been talking to you. You're a genius. And it's like, well, last time you called me an asshole, but okay. <laughs> I, I'll, be, I'll be a genius this time. Paul Mooney has done the same. 
I used to have a saying, if you have been cursed out by Dick Gregory or Paul Mooney, you're really not a comedian. They will curse you out. And then they'll turn around and tell you what a great act you are, you know, how they admire you. For young comedians or people who want to get into comedy, what are some tips that you would give them? Study uh, comedy. Anybody that wants to get into comedy, you should study it first. When and how I, would they do that? How? Go to comedy clubs. You're lucky when I first got into it, we didn't have as much YouTube stuff. We didn't have any YouTube stuff, actually. So we had to go to comedy clubs. So you can study YouTube, go to physically go to comedy clubs and talk to comedians, not young comics like yourself. Try to talk to older comics and let them know I'm trying to get into comedy any advice you can give me some will I'll give advice to any young comic that comes up some will not they'll tell you don't get in the business we got enough comics we don't need you there's like a tester uh, when you're a young comic how much you can, abuse you can take from older comics and if you can take a lot of abuse from older comics you can be a comic uh, because there's no amount of abuse you're going to get from an older comic that an audience is not going to give you. So you have to make sure that your your skin is thick. Uh, record all your shows as a uh, young comic or somebody just starting in comedy. Record it all and be very honest with yourself. When you hear a laugh, that is a good joke. you got to laugh. You didn't hear a laugh, well, try that same joke to more audiences because maybe they didn't get it. Maybe the timing was wrong. Maybe that joke belongs somewhere else in your set. I've had jokes that I thought were opening line jokes and nothing. I try them later on, three quarters in, they're killers. Because the audience is now, they've had a chance to know who you are and, and what they can you. accept yeah. from you and what they're comfortable with. Sometimes you kind of introduce yourself too early to them or you expose your warts too early and they, I don't even know you yet. You know, once they've got to know you, you can pretty much say anything you want. Be very judgmental, be very critical of yourself as a young comic. Write down your goals in comedy and I wish somebody had told us to do this because going into comedy right now you probably have a goal an overall goal you have a general goal do you want to be a cruise ship comic do you want to travel uh, do you want to be on television do you want to do movies do you want to be a comedy actor or actress an actress is garbage and you should, all actresses are actors and you should also have goals for each set yes you have to have short-term goals which are the immediate set that night have a goal for that week how many shows do you want to do that week uh, how many new jokes do you want to write for that week how many new jokes do you want to prefer Fact: How many jokes uh, that you've been working on do you want, finally want to put closure to? What do you want to do this month? How many shows do you want to do this year? How many paid shows? Because there's a difference. You have to go to the gym. You have to work out. Some people call it open mics. I call it where you can drop in somewhere and do some time and work out a new joke. But then when you're getting paid to do stand-up, don't do new jokes unless you're 100% confident in that joke. But you're getting paid to be at the performance level of whoever is hired you. Be at that level that they hired you for. Don't go up there experimenting and horsing around. Because not only is that their money, which they'll make more, it's your reputation, which you can't make enough. Once your reputation is shot that I hired this guy and he came up, he had a pad, he's he's doing new jokes. I'll never hire a guy. What unprofessional? Once they use the word unprofessional, then your goose is pretty much cooked. So let's talk about the pad. You see it more and more, and I think it's like horrible. I think it's good. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think you're getting paid, even if it's $2, you're getting paid. You should know the material. You should not uh, bring a pad. And if you're trying new jokes, just memorize it and bring it to the room. There's no reason to have a pad. Chris Rock does it, and he's the first one I saw do it. And I would accept it for someone like Chris Rock because when Chris Rock does it, he's working out for his next album. So he will have a pad of new jokes, and he will grade those jokes right there in front of the audience. He lets the audience know, basically, you're my guinea pig. But I'm working on an album or but a they, special that you also, will see. But he's also doing it where he's not getting paid it is a drop in it is a drop so it's in. very specific right. you're not going to see him not, in a concert right he's not doing a concert and saying well what do i want to talk about to, mm, no. this sounds good he's specifically letting you know i just dropped in yes. for a few minutes i'm trying out some new jokes for the special i'm going to be recording in x number of months i will accept it when a comic of notoriety does that right and usually they do it during the week when it's not a packed house, when the the house is light to medium, mm -hmm. but they never do it on the weekend shows. No, no, they will not disturb. Uh, I was uh, performing, and this was ages ago, I was performing in Atlanta, and it was during the week. Promoter came and said, Chris Rock is here, he wants to know, can he get some time? It's like, hell yeah, it's Chris Rock, of course. And he went up with his pad, he did like 10 minutes of, you know, material, and he said thanks. 
and went on about his business. He wasn't abusive on it. Uh, Andrew Dice Clay is abusive about that kind of stuff. I'll drop that out there, Andrew, because you are. <laughs> you know, um, if, if you have comics on the show, and this is what I appreciate about Chris, and this is why I'm outing Andrew Dice Clay and those of this mentality. If there's a show of young comics who were where you were before you blew up, you do like Chris Rock. You go in, hey, can I get a couple of minutes? I don't want to screw up your show. I just want to try out some jokes. You do it, and you get on. That's professional. Andrew Dice Clay said, and, hey, I just want to go up and tell a couple of jokes, and then you do 40 minutes. It's not professional because now I have to cancel my show with the comics that I had booked right. who need right. to, to try, who are trying to get where you are, and you're 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 vainglorious and, and needy, and you just must control an audience. But another thing about young comics that I would advise is well, let me just say one okay. one thing. Uh, and uh, Dice Clay is not the only one. <laughs> no, he's that not. there's a long list of, of of seasoned comics who go in during the week and will hog up the whole time. And these young comics who have been working so hard to get that one spot that they couldn't get for three months, yeah. now it's gone, and they're they're not being asked to come back the next no, day. No, yes. because you had your shot. It doesn't matter if Dice Clay or whoever hogged yes. your shot. That was your shot. Another thing I I, I, I do mention this in the webinar and I'll go ahead and tell you this now young comedians comedians period nobody knows your act like when you screw up in your act or you know you're you're off track or you you don't really know where you want to go next nobody knows that except you so if you tip them off then yeah your your entire set can be destroyed but if you learn certain techniques <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. If you learn certain, that was a technique. That wasn't a real cough. That was a BS cough. That was a cough to stall. And you can do that on stage anytime you want to. You can go ahead and grab the microphone stand and put the mic in it while you're stalling and act like you're getting ready to do a bit, but you were stalling. Learn stall techniques on stage because our main thing is we have to remain entertaining. You can drop the microphone if you want. Anything so you mentally can get back on track, but for you're not standing there looking at the audience like, uh, I'm lost. Never let them see you sweat. What should they do about confidence? You know, because a lot of times you have young, young stand-ups who are coming up. They come in the room. They don't know how to use the mic. They don't look at the audience. They're looking down. They're talking to the mic like this. And some of them are really funny, but yeah. you don't get it because they're so afraid. The only thing that can build confidence, honestly, is success. If you have a successful set, keep that set, play that set on the way in to build your confidence to know I am this good. I don't care if you're in a slump and your last three or four shows have been garbage. Play that set for yourself to remember how good you really are. And the rest of those, those are the anomalies. Those are the novelty sets. This is the real you. Give yourself that. Now, if you have never had a successful set, what you do to build your confidence, this is what I do, and I, I do this regularly. I'll watch somebody who's excellent. And it doesn't have to be, I might watch a Bruce Lee movie because that is a form of excellence. I might watch a Muhammad Ali boxing match because that's a form of excellence. I might watch a really good movie that I thought was a really excellent and the craftsmanship was there. And that will push me to want to rise to a certain level. Because if you are living in your head as a young comic, you're not that good. You're, you're a young comic. Watch Richard Pryor. Watch Robin Williams. Watch whoever you think is really great. And don't be intimidated by that. Say to yourself, if you have the confidence in yourself to even be a comedian, then you have the confidence to be a successful one. Who wants to be a failure? So look at somebody who's really good. And remember this as a comedian. It is joke to joke to joke, moment to moment to moment. Don't worry if somebody says, hey, I need you to do 10 minutes. It's minute to minute to minute. Think about it like sports for those of you who play football out there. It's not a game of 100 yards. It's a game of yard to yard, sometimes inches. Write new jokes. Uh, try to write a joke a day. And this is what I advise too. Write, only write what you know. And then what but you know, expand upon that by reading something new every day. It could just be one article that you just pull up on your phone. It could be something you want to know about or something that's just right there in the news. Pull up something that's a new fact 
every single day and try to write a joke behind it. Because at the end of the year, you got 365 new jokes or attempts. And if only half of them were any good, you got 100, and you're the mathematician here, you got 180 some odd jokes. That should be semi-valid. And in a year's worth of work, that ain't bad. There are some great podcasts of comics talking about how they write their jokes, how they break it down, what they do, what they learned. And that that's something that anybody can listen to or watch or not to overly push the webinar but not to under push it either i do tell you how to write solid jokes in it where you don't have the fat where you get to the point because a lot so of you comics do give them craft yes you do you do break down craft it of is a just joke. not about making money which is the end result of what every right. performer wants but you have to have that craftsmanship and that foundation and so within and the time the setup, frame the punch line you gotta have the setup and the punch line right. you can't get up there and just Start say riffing uh, some profanity, uh, you know, that MF, blah, 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 and that's not the funny, and I think that sometimes they watch really great comics who craft stuff, and because they say a curse word, they that's what they the joke. zoom in on. Paul Mooney said if you're a joke, and he would know if your joke has to end in a curse word, you don't have a joke. Curse words are supposed to be the spice. They're not supposed to be the meal. They're the icing. They're not the cake. So if I'm in a place where people are drinking liquor, I probably will curse. If I'm in a place where they're drinking smoothies, I probably won't because it's the mindset of the audience. It's like playing for old people versus younger people. You know, I can do a Cardi B joke all day long in front of young people. Old people, they don't get it. <laughs> I did, I did it. I was in Cocoa Beach, Florida. I told a Cardi B joke, and they all stared at me, and I said, well, my daughter wrote that joke for me, and I don't get it myself. And then they laughed. And that's another thing as a young comic. Do not be afraid to ad lib. Now, this is a rule of thumb, and I hope you, you follow this. Get a solid five or ten minute ad that you can take anywhere. Solid. And from that, build another five, build another five, build another five. Before you know it, you got 30 or 45 minutes. But within, once you get that solid act, be able and don't be afraid to jump off track and say something else that has nothing to do with that. Like if somebody comes in the back of the room and they're wearing a funny suit, don't be afraid to say it. Don't be afraid to live in the moment. To call the elephant out in the room. Right, because other people are tripping it. If, they're, if the mic goes, if the sound goes off in the microphone, don't be afraid to put the microphone down and say something like, where'd you get this radio shack, you know, crap, or whatever you want to say. Don't be afraid to do it because you're exercising that ad lib thing and it goes back to what I said earlier. Nobody knows your act. They don't know if that was part of your act or not. Yeah. If you didn't get to say what you wanted to say in that moment, but you came up with something funny after, write it down because there will be a next time there was always for you, be a next to, time. Use, always, it always for you to use that opportunity. Keep a piece of paper and a pen, or at very least, your cell phone to record. And the reason I say paper and pen is because cell phone can run out of the battery, you can be out of the signal area, any weird thing can happen with electronics or technology. You got a pencil or a pen and a piece of paper, you'll be able to write down whatever you want to, yeah. and it's there. And I'm a believer to do index cards. Okay. Put your, put your jokes on index cards. That's a good problem. Because then you can shift around if you're, you know. Build your set like yes. that. Yes, because then you you know if you if you go in if you go in the smoothie room and then your next set is in the bar, right. and you need you know you can't do the same jokes. You have Those you can cards. swap them out, and I learned that from opening for Patrice Russian. Nice, okay. Because during the week the audience stayed for both shows, and I only had one set. set. Okay, and then I had to do the set again. For the same, same people. Yeah. And so I started learning, wait a minute. And so during the week when mm -hmm. it was the same audience and they were not leaving, like the weekend audience, I started learning, wait a minute, okay, what material do I want to yeah. do? How can right. I switch it up? They already heard this, but yeah. if I do it in a different way, it, it's going to fool them a little right. bit. No, I mean, it does. it's the, it still, does. It's the it, same. It can't be by rote. It can't right. be yeah, right. like a robot. Right, yeah. and, and that really does help. And it, there's something about the cards, you know, uh, what I love is Joan Rivers used to catalog her jokes in cards. I didn't, I, I didn't know cards. that either until wow. later. I, I, I saw her uh, documentary, and she had like wall-to-wall -wall card uh, files 
And she would pull it, and I, this is this was this joke, and this what? I was like, I am so impressed. Yeah, Carlin does that too. Seinfeld does that. There are comics who write down everything. They can tell you the set they did in 1999, March 12th, and all of that. And they are shocked by comics who do not obsessively write like that. Um, I'm kind of in the middle. I, I write down a whole lot of jokes, and I've got bags and boxes of jokes that I haven't got to. And, I, and I've been trying to like, you know, get to them and all that, but then you get so consumed with the set that you're doing. And that's another thing as a young comic. If you can do this, you will amaze me as much as Don D.C. Curry. I asked Don D.C. Curry, because I, I was telling him, well, man, I've done about 6,000 6, shows. And he said, I've done 8,922 shows. He knew the exact number. And I said, how do you know that? He said, well, I started keeping track when I first started, but part of that 2,952 are shows that I did um, as podcasts, but I did monologues on each one, and the other 6,950. So he knew he, the he breakdown. And he said, after tonight, it will be, because we were at one of his podcasts, and he said, after tonight, it'll be blah, 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 blah. As a young comic, this is your sport. If you can keep stats of basketball players and you know how fast a track person can run and all that, keep your own stats. Yes. I, I've had comics that have told me, have said to me, it's like, well, man, I, li I, like, I like comedy, man, but I don't like the game. I said, but you're a sports fanatic. How can you not like your own game? Thank you so much for Thank joining you. me. Thank you This for was me. a incredibly informative talk, talk with you. I think anybody wants to get into comedy, you have gotten so much valuable information. Look below for all the links on Daryl, on his books, on his uh, webinar, and also on him personally. If you have any comments, please let us know right below. Give us some feedback. We love to get it. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can get current information as it comes up. Thank you.